Hi everyone, welcome to our live stream with the Living Tongues Institute. We're really excited to be here. Today we're going to be going over our toolkit, which we recently launched. We have with us today Ana Luisa and Jacob, both from the Living Tongues Institute. Ana Luisa is the programs director and Jacob is their web developer. And then from Wiki Tongues, you have me and Daniel. I'm Kristen. Oh, hey. Sorry, I can hear myself now. This is very awkward. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> hey, <laughs> sorry. everyone. <laughs> um, sorry, I could hear myself no playing from the safari. <laughs> yeah, I'm good now. I had to close the video. Okay, so I'm focused again. Um, and then, so we have myself, I'm Kristen, and I'm the programs director, and Daniel, who is our executive director. Hi, Azaria, how are you? You are welcome to type in the comments, ask any questions. We can answer you in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Swahili, any other languages that we have? Catalan, of course. Catalan, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Catalan, yes, so please feel free to ask your questions in any of those languages. And we're excited to get started. So today we're going to be talking about the Language Sustainability Toolkit. If you would like to follow along as we go through it, you can find it on the Wikitongues website, wikitongues.org, or on the Living Tongues website, livingtongues.org, and you can find the toolkit and download it there. We'll also be showing um, some brief glimpses of it here during the live stream. And so this toolkit was created by Wikitongues and the Living Tongues Institute as a way to answer the question, how do I save my language? This is a question we're often asked and it's a, it's a really large question. There's many different ways that communities and speakers can go about this. And so we partnered with our different expertise in different fields to try to start answering this question. So it's a toolkit that works, walks you through these steps. And Anna is gonna get us started by explaining how to get started. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Kristen. I'm just really excited to be here um, with the Wikitimes community on YouTube. Hi, everybody. Um, we've been collaborating um, for the last few months developing this toolkit. Um, so it gives you a set of ideas and it's a kind of choose your own adventure as well uh, format for um, revitalizing and preserving your language. Um, so, one of the questions we get often as well at Living Tongues Institute um, for Endangered Languages is where do I start? You know, if there's so many language, language activists out there who know their languages need to be preserved and um, they're just looking for, for best practices and a guide, a path to start. So that's why we put our heads together and made this toolkit as Kristen says. Um, so it was taking a step back and asking yourself, what is language sustainability? What does it mean? Um, it means that um, for a language to live on for generations to come, the community needs ways to have transmission and have regular use by speakers, not just in virtual spaces or through texting, but also in physical spaces in their daily life. Um, so we've, we've brought both those approaches and examples to create immersive environments in your physical spaces and in virtual spaces in this toolkit. And we think uh, both of those are very important. Um, you know, as, as you might know already, a lot of languages are in danger because of the long-term impacts of colonization and cultural assimilation and globalization. So, um, but the tools of globalization can be used also to preserve and revitalize languages. So um, we show a lot of examples of that in this toolkit as well, uh, creating digital resources and websites and online forums for you to talk with other people in your language. So um, that's part of the first step is understanding what is language sustainability? What does that look like for you? Um, in each region of the world, it's gonna be quite different. Um, and so you're sort of creating this, this journey and you're, you're taking this step into preserving your language and you have to see what's out there and you have to see what you can do um, to make a difference. Um, so one of the things that we encourage people to do is um, creating media, um, working with other cultural stakeholders and figuring out what is the best way that people can access. What are those access points for your language? Um, and one of those things that uh, Wikitongues is doing great um, is creating oral histories. So those 
um, recorded texts and online oral texts through video narratives and interviews and stories. Those are amazing, amazing um, oh, kind of like witness reports, you know, <laughs> of, um, of fluent speakers or semi-fluent speakers who have knowledge of the language and culture. So even if you don't have knowledge of your own heritage, culture and language, you can interview others who do and create those materials that will live on um, through the internet for other people to enjoy and for you to learn from. So in our Get Started um, section, which starts uh, around um, page six of the toolkit, um, one in of the letter first- format. In letter format, yes. Yeah, Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, we have a mobile friendly version and an A4 version and the page numbers change. Uh, That's depending right. on what you're- Also a European formatted version. Isn't yes. that that's A4, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. That so Daniel, that's right. You um we you designed it in the various formats, right? To accommodate yeah. different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm looking at the the letter um eight and a half by eleven format, but um uh on the link which we will share, um the toolkit the toolkit is um, available and for mobile friendly only and for um, A4 and letter. Um, so in the section that's called getting started, we talk first about finding your team, and I think that this is a really important part of uh, the language revitalization process that does not get talked about often enough. Um, languages don't get revived in a vacuum. So one person can make a lot of progress, you know, documenting and cataloging, annotating, transcribing and everything. But you really need a, a, at least a team of, you know, two, three people to work on many aspects of the language. You have to find like-minded people who can join you um, in your plan and use each other's skill sets um, to, to work on different aspects of the language. It, you know, if you form a team, maybe someone is more inclined to do... Um, the technical side and the digital side, and another person might be more into the artistic side um, or the the documentation side. So there's so many um, different ways to approach how you build your team. Um, Daniel, do you have any thoughts on that for how people find their potential collaborators? Sure. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that building a team does something uh, which is essential to the long-term survival of your language, which is that it, it seeds community around your language, right? So if, if you're worried about the future of your language, chances are that's because your community isn't using it as much as you think they should, and it doesn't feel like your community will still be using it in a few generations. So if you think of your revitalization initiative as the seed of that community that will carry your language on and in the future, you can see how important that is. Um, these days, I think a lot of people from minoritized language communities are experience some form of cultural displacement in which other speakers of your language might not be in your immediate uh, community, um, or you might not have like immediately physical access to them. And if that's the case, um, this is where the tools of globalization come in very handy. Um, if you run searches on Facebook for groups pertaining to your language or culture, you might find collaborators there. If you search for hashtags uh, pertaining to your language on Instagram, Twitter, or other social media platforms, you might find speakers there. Um, you can reach out to local universities that have history departments, anthropology departments, or linguistics departments. There may be students or professors there who specialize in or are learning about your culture and they might be able to connect you with people. So just think of all the different ways that you might find someone from your community uh, and go through the list. Yes, and that's, you know, that's a good point. Um, I think that uh, college campuses should be, you know, a great um, unifying hub for a lot, of these, a lot of these ideas to circulate. Sadly, it's not always the case everywhere that um, there's a good synergy between academics and local community stakeholders. Yeah. Sometimes there's a big disconnect. 
and those things need to be remedied. Um, I think with um, a lot of the positive social movements that we're seeing going on right now, I think we're going to see some of that hierarchy start to dissolve over the coming years. And I think that's really good for endangered language activism. I think there needs to be much more synergy, much more interconnectedness between the local languages that are eroding and the work that's being done in like you know prestigious academic settings. Um, and it just kind of like level that playing field and and create more more cross collaboration um, between people who are really interested in these languages. I think it's really important. And I see that happening uh, many different places in the world already in um, in BC and in, in uh, British Columbia and in Canada. There's already a lot more synergy between local indigenous communities and um, and people in academia. Um, and also the same thing in, in New Zealand and some parts of Australia. Um, here in the U.S., I think we need a lot more improvement in that regard. Um, so I think that we are all part of that part of that uh, movement to improve these relationships. I think, um, you know, as many many of us live on uh, uh, traditional lands, you know, that and where there were so many languages spoken here that you know need to be brought to the forefront. So keep that in mind that you know, seeking institutional help for your language sometimes could go great, sometimes might not go so great. <laughs> uh, but we are all part of that change, all those positive social changes that are happening right now. Um, so yeah, so that's the first, one of the first key points that we put forward in this um, toolkit. And I'd be interested, Jacob, to hear from you too. Um, you've worked on different um, language revitalization tools and different types of settings, like with us as a nonprofit and also in college type settings. Um, what are your thoughts on putting together a, a good team of people? Yeah, I think it's really key to find those people who are excited about your language. And one of the things that I think um, we could do to improve that, I know some of the online tools for uh, revitalizing your language do this, is be able to build into these tools the ability to connect with other users. And so when you are with people who are utilizing um, just different resources for your language, also take advantage of the people who are already there in those, mm -hmm. in those kind of communities, be able to build in ways for them to connect. Um, I know that some of the tools out there offer those options. And so if you're using a certain tool that offers connection opportunities, take advantage of those. And if the tool you're using isn't yet giving you a way to connect with other users, um, people who develop websites love to hear from you. So that would be a great opportunity to send them a short message. Use the contact form and say, hey, I'm interested in you know, connecting with more people from my language. I noticed you have a valuable resource here, but it's really hard to send messages or know who else is using this tool. Is there a way you could add that feature? Um, so that would be really really valuable. A lot of people who don't build websites don't always think about the contact form, um, but that's one of the best things you can do if you're looking for something additional and it's not on a tool online yet, is just click that contact form and send a short message and uh, the web developers love, love to hear from you. So that's a good way to, to connect that you might not have thought of as well. There's um, a really good story in a language that was brought back by the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, which is an indigenous nation in the United States. Uh, they actually have an hour long video of the Tunica language in English on our YouTube channel. Um, this was a language that went dormant in 1948, which is a, in linguistics, a kind of politically correct way of saying it went extinct, which means the last native speaker died. Um, however, right before he died, he worked with a linguist to build a dictionary in his language. And in the 80s, uh, someone named Donna Pierrette, who is a member of the tribe, decided that she wanted to bring the Tunica language back. And so she started learning the language with her family. Um, we were talking, this whole section right now is about how do you find people to work with to bring your language back, to invest in the future of your language. And sometimes you can start really, really close to home. Um, after Donna and her daughter Lisbeth and her son Jean-Luc uh, 
started learning the language. They started sending out newsletters to their community um, just about the language. And all of a sudden, other families from the community started responding, saying, wow, we want to get involved, too. And before you know it, by 2010, their 10 percent of the whole tribe is involved in bringing back the Tunica language. Um, there are 32 new fluent speakers. Um, some people are actually teaching Tunica to their children, raising new native speakers. Um, so it doesn't like all of these different strategies, right? Like reaching out to universities, um, going on social media to find people. Sometimes you really can just start at home uh, with your family because chances are they are also from your culture. Um, and we'll be excited to fight for your language too. Yeah. So what happens now once you've found people to work with, you've found three people to save your language, uh, what, what happens next? Um, well, the next part of um, the toolkit talks about identifying challenges and solutions that you might face. So that means that in every part of the world where language revitalization is happening, there might be different kinds of roadblocks that you encounter. That means problems, um, issues, things that you don't know how to deal with that you need to find the right remedy for. So in the toolkit, we've listed a few different uh, common types of problems that people have at the beginning of their projects. And so we list some examples of how people have dealt with these situations. Uh, one of them is speaker demographics. So that's um, the issue of there's only a small number of speakers left of your language and most of them are quite elderly. So um, there's a lot of work to be done to document this language, but um, how do you bridge the, the generational gap between um, younger enthusiastic people who want to learn the language and then um, elderly, the, elder, the few elderly fluent speakers who may be left? and who need assistance and who want to record as much as they can before they pass on. Um, so what we often recommend in situations like that is for um, a couple of young people to work long term with one or two elders um, and to create a trusting relationship. Um, you know, that relationship might already exist if, they're, if the people are related to each other and to interview and those and record those elders um, in your community in a safe space where um, everyone feels um, trusting and can communicate their knowledge um, to people who really care. Um, and so I've worked with many communities who take this model on to have young people who are able to, to use um, video cameras and phones to record their elders and then uh, use that to promote the, the language um, online. Sometimes these resources that you make might only be used for your own community, and that's great too. You don't necessarily have to publicize it to the whole world. Some language communities feel more comfortable if everything just stays internal. Other people want all of their amazing interviews and videos that they make to be online to connect with the speakers who might live far away and who are not in close proximity with the last fluent speakers. So a lot of languages have large diaspora communities and those people are looking for resources to connect with the language. So in those situations, you want to have something on the internet. So and dealing with... For, yes. for mm -hmm. people who may not be familiar, the concept of diaspora refers to when people from your culture have a, a permanent community that is not in your ancestral homeland, right? Like it's, it's um, you know, when there's a group of people from one culture living in another place. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And so that, uh, that applies to a lot of uh, immigrant communities around the world. Myself, as a second generation immigrant, um, I'm always trying to find ways to connect with my heritage languages. Um, so for example, Quechua was lost in my family, but I'm always going online to find 
resources and recordings um, of Quechua speakers since Quechua is having a massive revitalization in Peru and um, has already been consistently used in Bolivia. So I can, as a, as a member of the Quechua diaspora, um, I need those resources online to connect um, and try to learn my language, even though it's been lost in my own family. So that's an example. Um, I don't have, in, in terms of the, the age of speakers, I don't have anyone close to me where I live in North Carolina. Um, there's no one I can learn Quechua from directly, but I can go online. So yeah, um, uh, Daniel, did you have any other um, thoughts on that topic too? Not yet. We'll get okay. to it though. Okay. The next roadblock that um, people often encounter when they're starting their projects is um, internalized shame. Um, this is a big one, and this is sort of peeling back the layers of um, all the different types of guilt and shame and trauma that people have experienced around their language. Um, it's hard to cover all the reasons and the manifestations of this phenomenon right here, but it's very important to realize that languages often disappear because they are discriminated against. It might be subtle discrimination or it might be very overt discrimination by governments and policies. So these, this type of shame goes really deep inside of people and it stops them from speaking their language or seeking it or even admitting that they know it. And this has happened in so many different ways around the world over time. And it's not something we can just gloss over. It's something that we have, we have to acknowledge in this process. And also in the process of learning language, people also feel guilt about not speaking it well enough or not really knowing, or should I, really, should I record myself in this language if I'm not fluent? There's, there's those types of, um, that learning related guilt also comes up too. So there's, there's so many facets to it that are the, the emotional side of what we're doing. Um, and it, that can be hard for people to express. So that's an important roadblock to understand when you're doing this type of work. Um, Jacob or uh, Daniel, do you want to jump in on that topic? Or Kristen? <laughs> hmm. I'll happy to. Um, at the end of the day, linguistic diversity is in danger because governments spent a lot of money forcing people to assimilate and so languages are endangered because the cultures they represent have been at the blunt end of either genocide or racism or colonialism um you're going to be very hard to find an endangered language that isn't tied to some form of discrimination and so communities today live with the effects of that the impacts of that and so people are often shy about speaking their language because it is tied to a lot of trauma for the community. And so that can be a big challenge when you're trying to bring your language back to get people to feel proud of the language again, to feel proud of the culture, right? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's what we hope to restore too with some of the work that we're doing is, um, is re restoring pride and value to this type of intangible heritage. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's so important um, to give it visibility and to promote it um, in, a, in a positive way. I would, I would love to add a, just a, a story um, regarding this topic. We have someone in the chat that's joined us from Friesland. I'm not sure if Fair is in here anymore. Um, they left a comment of greetings from Friesland. And there's an organization working in Lefort and in the capital of Friesland where people speak West Frisian. And, um, other Frisian varieties. And there's a organization that has been working over the years of overcoming this internalized generational shame that has been instilled um, through the use of Dutch by the government and the majority of the population and an internalized shame of speaking their language. And so this organization, Afuk, came up with really creative ways to overcome this. So they started these, oh, still here definitely still here thanks for joining in all right hi Yay. welcome hi. yeah so maybe okay. 
if you're a Frisian speaker, are you a Frisian speaker, Fair? Um, so they, they started coming up with these really cool, catchy campaigns, especially focused on getting youth involved, getting teenagers involved in social media and local celebrities. So um, they came up with uh, flash mobs where people would sing or speak in Frisian in public spaces unexpectedly. Um, they encouraged local stores to give discounts, maybe like a 5% discount to someone who came in speaking Frisian as opposed to Dutch. Nice. And then they <laughs> did this really fun, catchy campaign with these massive blow up lips. They're like red lips. There's a picture circulating way in the archives. Ah, oh, it's his, it's his, their native language. Ah, oh, thanks. I, I hope I'm not messing up this story. Um, yeah, so they, they came up with uh, this red massive lip and way in the archives of the wiki tongues instagram you can find a picture of daniel holding his up and so this red blow up lip says pratma frisk which means speak more frisian in west frisian and so they encourage people they would go out to bars at like midnight um, to have people hold up these lips and take pictures and it had a very viral ability quality to it because it looked so fun and catchy and they've reported great numbers since then um, because it made it made the language seem really fun to teenagers and inclusive and um, a cool thing to be doing and so it's boosted numbers of people speaking the language in public. Oh yeah, I love that story. I love that. <laughs> it's so it yeah, it's so awesome. And I think that Kristen, you you added some information about that in the toolkit itself. Um, so for those of you who download the PDF, you can see it as an example. Um, that some of these same um, same examples of um, a visibility for the language are in there too. That's awesome. <laughs> My goodness, we have, I mean, there's there's so many more um, issues in this part of the toolkit that I will just mention very briefly um, so we can get on to some of the other parts of the toolkit too. Um, but yeah, in, in the, in the uh, list of roadblocks that people sometimes face, um, distance, I mentioned distance, not being in close proximity to other fluent speakers, uh, but using the internet to connect with others, um, funding, Funding is a huge issue, probably one of the biggest. Um, for some some places, there's very little public support um, for reviving m minority and endangered languages. So we have a, um, a list of funding sources included at the end of the toolkit for people looking to apply for grants to work on their languages. Um, that's really important uh, to, to make these projects sustainable is to make sure that you can cover your costs and pay people to do some of the work. And so a lot of us who do this kind of work um, are used to operating on shoestring budgets, but it's important to have some funding. <laughs> um, and one of the other big topics that I think we'll probably discuss a, quite a few times on this live stream is orthography. Um, so I'd love to open this up to you, Daniel and Jacob. Uh, we've worked on, uh, Jacob and I are, you know, currently grappling with many different languages <laughs> for the talking dictionaries where there are multiple writing systems and also multiple dialects as a separate issue. But uh, not having a standardized writing system can um, be an issue um, technically and practically. So Jacob, I'd love to, to hear from you about um, writing systems and special characters. <laughs> Yeah, at the base level, uh, what people often do in languages that don't um, that have characters which aren't widely available on the web yet or on their phones is they kind of use a contrived writing system. And, and that's, you know, a great way to start. Just do the best you can. But as you go further along, you'll find that there's a lot of resources out there um, which can support different scripts. And some of the big tech companies... Uh, um, Google is pushing hard to make more availability, and so if you vouch for your language, you you know, and you offer to help, you could definitely be instrumental in pushing forward some new characters that could be helpful for your language. As well, there are some smaller tools. One that's notable is called Keyman, which they have over a thousand different um, languages supported with the various writing systems. Which you could install that on your phone and be able to send text messages back and forth. Um, that's a really useful one. Uh, one thing that we're wanting to do on our talking dictionary software that Living Tongues is building 
is make it so even if you don't have anything special installed, if you're working on building your dictionary, we'll have an on-screen keyboard with some of those special characters. So there's a variety of ways to um, get the scripts and um, individual characters that you need. And if, if at the end of the day what you're looking for isn't there, once again, just you know get in touch and kind of look around for those who can help you get that supported. Um, but it's an, it's an ongoing process, and a lot of people are working on it and are wanting to know how to improve it, for sure. And if your language doesn't have a standardized writing system, that's also totally fine. Um, I think, you know, only about half the world's languages are written formally, and that's starting to change because of the increasing, like, ubiquity of texting and writing your language on social media. But, you know, if your language doesn't have a standardized writing system, there are so many ways to document it and promote it using audio and video that you can kind of skip this, unless you really think it's important to write your language, and that's when you want to start thinking about, okay, how do we write this language, right? And, you know, that can include creating a whole new script, or it can mean adopting an existing script like Roman alphabet or Arabic characters or um, Cyrillic or whatever is most common in your part of the world. Yes, and at Living Tongues, um, some of the endangered languages we've documented did not have writing systems. So what we use to document them is the International Phonetic Alphabet to, to really you know, capture all the sounds of all the consonants and all the vowels that we hear. So in some cases, the, that's what linguists have to do if there's no writing system. But often there is a desire from the community to, to, to have some kind of easy to use writing system. So when we help communities um, with that process, we really let we we really emphasize that the communities themselves create their own writing system that works for them. We try not to be the ones telling them you need to use this symbol or you need to use that symbol because at the end of the day, it's the own it's the the local teachers and leaders and cultural stakeholders that really know what's going to work for them. And it's it's not a it's not an overnight process uh, to create a writing system. Uh, we get this question a lot. Um, you know, how to <laughs> what is the best way forward? I've worked with many communities that have had several writing systems over the years, and they need to um, have council meetings or you know larger leadership meetings to have to make these decisions. Uh, one community that we are currently working in in, in India. Uh, for the Sora language, they have five competing writing systems. So that that will that situation will not be resolved anytime soon because the different writing systems are used by different people with uh, religious affiliations or political affiliations. So we as linguists, we we you know we don't intervene and tell tell people what they need to use or not, but we try to represent all of those writing systems inside the tools that we create. So that can be a lot of <laughs> a lot of data, you know, for each entry. But we try to we try to be um, uh, be aware of those competing writing systems and display them as best we can in in the tools that we create for those languages. Um, and so moving on to um, uh, Kristen, do we have any um, other comments or feedback in the meantime? No, we're we're having some comments in terms of the toolkit itself, um, in terms of translation and language in the toolkit, but no specific questions yet that I haven't answered to put it on the screen. Uh, I, I would say to people who are thinking about this, um, we are going to be iterating on this toolkit and releasing new versions all the time. We're actually in the middle of editing it now uh, to make it more easy to read, um, especially for people whose, you know, first language is in English. Uh, mm -hmm. Once that edit is done, we intend to translate it into a bunch of languages. And so mm -hmm. if you have feedback on stuff that doesn't make sense, on stuff that you do not understand, and if you simply want to help translate it into your language, please write us hello at wikitongues.org. Mm -hmm. We would love 
to get you involved. And that's partly why we're doing this live stream now. So, I, um, I completely forgot that you guys couldn't see the comments I've been putting on the screen. <laughs> so um, I've been throwing up a lot of comments, um, a lot of people excited when we mention their country or their language. Um, we also had someone that chimed in and said the toolkit is quite dense and hard to understand. So you've already mm -hmm. spoken to that point. And they've already emailed me and they're happy to help us read over it before we launch the um, new version uh, with more streamlined Great. language. Yeah, and we have some Great. people I think that are interested in translating. And I'm sorry, I forgot that you can't see the comments when I put them on the screen. Um, so I'll be better about noting that when I put them on the screen. Oh yeah, great. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm I'm curious, and and I yeah. think it's such an important point. Um, uh, so I tend to work with a, a lot of a lot of academics and, and a lot of different activists, and I I want the tools that we create to really be accessible to everyone. And I think the fact that it's that the toolkit the way it is is um, too dense and too technical. It, it shows this disconnect between um, between linguistics as a field and then like the actual people who need to <laughs> revitalize these languages. And so, yeah, I, I apologize for that. I want these tools to be very um, consistent, easy to understand, and easy to translate um, without it causing further roadblocks for people to understand. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so we'll let you let everyone know when the new, the next version is released. This will be a living document that we're always going to be updating when we receive feedback. So we'll let you know when the next version is released sometime in the near future. And we, yes, please send us our fee your feedback if there's a part that isn't clear, or if you think there's another format that we could share this toolkit to make it even more accessible. Um, we'd love yeah. to do that if you think a series of videos could be helpful or mm -hmm. um, an audio format or anything like that, um, let us know. I love that idea of the video series, like a short video series for mm -hmm. each section. I think that would be great. And I'd ha be happy to do them in French and Spanish too. Ooh. I think that would be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. And we'll get some volunteers <laughs> to do other some other languages to have it in, uh, in as many as we want. Um, okay, great. Um, so uh, should uh, Daniel, do you want to um, do you want to lead us through some of the next sections of the toolkit? Sure. Happy to. Um, and if you just joined this live stream by chance, uh, welcome. Uh, Kristen and I are here with Anna and Jacob from the Living Tongues Institute, and we are reviewing our language sustainability toolkit, which it, we hope can help you get started keeping your language alive. And we were just talking about different challenges that people face when they want to keep their language alive, and um, that can include uh, declining population of speakers, uh, cultural shame around the language, a few other problems uh, are physical distance, maybe the speakers of the language or members of the culture don't live close together. Um, the internet is a very good remedy to that. Um, funding is a challenge that we're still trying to figure out, um, so we'll re circle back on that another time. Um, uh, writing system, uh, which if your language isn't written or your writing system isn't supported by phones, that can, you know, uh, be a challenge. Um, differences in dialect or accent in your language can be a challenge because sometimes uh, people aren't always in agreement about which accent or dialect of the language to keep alive. Um, another challenge is your language isn't officially recognized. Um, and so these are all different problems that require different solutions from creating content in your language to political activism around your language. And we want to now bring this conversation back to the beginning. Um, we said that the first and like most important thing to do is find other people in your community who want to keep the language alive. Find a team of two to three people. You'll keep each other motivated. Um, you'll give each other new ideas and you'll build community around using your language, which is so, so important. Um, 
one thing that you want to do in the very beginning is assess the health of your language. Um, and part of that is looking at the different challenges that your language faces, which we just talked about a second ago. Um, there is in like academic linguistics a scale of what they call language vitality, what we call language health, um, which is generally from healthy to extinct or dormant. And basically what this scale looks at is how widely the language is used in daily life, um, how well the language is being passed on to the next generation. And this is often the biggest problem that you're probably going to be working on if you want to keep your language alive. And so this section in the toolkit, Understanding Language Health, breaks this scale down for you and can help you figure out what you need to do um, to keep your language alive. Um, Kasane asks if the uh, IPA, can you repeat that question, Kristen? I think I got it. Was the IPA if the language changes speaker by speaker? Is, was that it, Kristen? Mm -hmm, that was it. Yes, it's true. The, um, yes, the IPA does. Um, so the question was, does the international phonetic alphabet transcription of, um, of a sentence in the language, does that change speaker to speaker? And yes, it can, because um, speakers um, change their pronunciation <clears throat> depending on age, um, gender identification, occupation, um, region, <clears throat> um, socioeconomic um, status. There's so many different things that we analyze on the sociolinguistic side that can affect the way the person speaks. And you see that in English and French and Spanish and other dominant languages and, and Russian and everything. You see um, subtle variations of usually it's vowels, but it could be consonants as well. It could be diphthongs. It could be many things. So um, yes, the, we try to capture those variations in pronunciation when we transcribe in phonetic alphabet. So um, once you have decided, once you've determined the health of your language and some of the challenges that it's facing, um, you're going to want to start keeping your language alive. And the process of doing that typically breaks down into two categories. There's documenting your language and promoting your language. So we're going to briefly run through the documenting your language uh, section of the toolkit. And we have a couple different methods here. Um, the first thing that you want to do is figure out what documentation already exists in your language, because it's very possible that even if it was 100 years ago, some academic or missionary made a dictionary in your language and it's sitting in the library somewhere. Um, earlier in this stream, we talked about the Tunica people of Louisiana who are revitalizing their language. And they actually started by driving to New Orleans and photocopying dictionaries that were now by then 40, 50 years old, just sitting in a library somewhere waiting to be used. Um, and these days, because of the internet, it's much easier to find documentation in your language. If there isn't any documentation in your language and or, or there isn't enough documentation in your language, you've got to start creating it yourself. And one of the easiest ways to get started doing that is by recording video in your language, recording oral histories of people speaking, talking about themselves, their culture, whatever they want to talk about. Um, this is great because it preserves the language in its spoken form, and that's a really, really important thing for students of the language so they can hear it. Uh, this also helps you build a relationship with fluent speakers in your community, right? Um, in a lot of instances, you might be recording your grandparents or someone's grandparents, elders in the community speaking, and um, this is a really, really great way to get started documenting the language. After you have recorded video, uh, you want to transcribe the video, if, which means if your language is written, you're going to want to write out exactly what the person said in your language. And then you're going to want to translate the video too. 
Um, the reason that it's really good to translate is it becomes easier to map out the vocabulary of your language to the vocabulary of other languages. This is almost like a precursor to building a dictionary, which actually brings us to the next stage of documentation, which is something that the Living Tongues Institute does really, really well, uh, which is creating a lexicon, or in other words, building dictionaries. Yes, and if you're just tuning in, um, uh, Jacob and I are here from Living Tongues Institute, and I would love to hear a bit from Jacob. He's our wonderful web developer who's been um, building um, the latest mobile-friendly version of our software. Uh, would you give us some background, Jacob, about the Talking Dictionaries? Yeah, thanks, Anna. I've always loved building websites and tools that are useful. And when I was studying linguistics in school a couple of years ago, I was using really powerful desktop software that can help linguists to build a dictionary. But the question in my mind was, how can I take this amazing data and this really gigantic desktop um, platform and be able to put it onto the phone in my pocket? Because the phone is something that, a technology that's been invented very recently, and we haven't fully taken advantage of it yet. What I was envisioning and wanting was the ability for someone to be able to walk around their community and as they think of a new word that hasn't been documented yet or isn't in their dictionary, they could pull out their phone and they could write it down. If they see a picture of that item, they could pull out their phone once again, take a picture of the item. They could record it. Perhaps uh, they maybe want someone else to record it so they could go over to their, their grandma and then they could, they could you know, work with their grandma to get the word recorded. Um, there are so many different parts that the mobile technology affords us that we need to be taking advantage of. Um, and so it, it gives a way where communities can now, if they take advantage of these tools, they should have a way to have an up-to-date dictionary that is instantly live. And anytime someone makes an edit to it, you know, the latest version is, is published, so to speak. Um, they can access it offline. They can do, there's all sorts of things that the web tool affords us. And we talked earlier about the um, connection with other community members. There should be a connection point where if someone suggests an edit to the dictionary, then someone elsewhere, maybe in that same town or even across the real, gets a notification. Hey, so-and-so submitted a new word to the dictionary. They're asking for your help to review it, um, or they'd like you to record it. Um, and so we can have this real time back and forth uh, dictionary building. And so as I'm working mm -hmm. on this desktop software, I'm thinking to myself, why is this not built yet? We need to be able to do this. Um, we all have dictionary building tools in our back pockets, and uh, we should work hard to move the, the technology that direction. So that's what we're doing with the talking dictionary software. All those pieces aren't, aren't in there yet, but as many of the advantages that the mobile technology gives us, we're wanting to, to build into it. So, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a question? Yeah, can I, can I answer that one? We have a yeah, question. Yeah. Is the app free? So the app is free, and that's a good question about calling it an app. It's actually a web app, which is not a term that's commonly used, but it's a website that progressively improves if your phone is new enough and can handle it. So you can visit it with a link from Twitter, for example. So you could click on an entry share it with someone, they can tap on it and instantly look at it. But if they really like the dictionary and they would like to use it more, they can also add it to their home screen on Android. On uh, iOS, it's a little bit more complicated. You click the menu and click add to home screen. Um, but Android will prompt you. And then that will save the words offline. So it's on your home screen and it works like an app that you download from the Play Store, except for you never had to go find it in the Play Store. You just had to click on a link from your friend or family member or from a Google search. And so um, that's what we mean when we say Talking Dictionaries web app. It's a, uh, it's a simple website, but it can improve and get really powerful if you enjoy using it. So that was a great question. Yeah, great question from Azira. And I just wanted to give a little background. Since we've been building Talking Dictionaries for over 15 years now, the project was pioneered by David Harrison and Greg Anderson. Um, and they documented many, many languages using the desktop version of this software. And over the last couple of years, um, 
um, with Jacob, we've been uh, starting to work on the mobile friendly version. Um, and so, you know, many people have contributed to this, um, the, this new version of the web app. And I want to also give one Im important ecosystems note is that we are the, the direction that we're heading in um, for this free web app is to have more environmental and ecological knowledge in it too. So we didn't mention that in this discussion yet, but uh, we're losing a lot of language diversity and a lot of biodiversity at the same time. So um, exactly, someone just asked about uh, wildflower, wildflower classification, yes. So we are integrating that idea of using the talking dictionary as a conservation tool, not only for languages, but also for species identification, such as local names for flowers, um, for all, all different species of, of plants and animals. And mm -hmm. this is why language diversity is so important and why cultural diversity is so important. Uh, when we keep our cultures alive, we're keeping our histories alive and we're also sustaining our relationship with the natural world. Um, I do want to add that depending on where you live in, to, in the world, um, and maybe your Wi-Fi isn't great, um, when you're recording vocabulary in your language, when you're building a dictionary, you can really use any tool that works best for you. Um, talking dictionaries is definitely like, as in my opinion, the best platform there is if you want to do it online. Uh, but there's a Wiki Tongues volunteer in Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and you know his Wi-Fi kind of goes in and out, and he's been building a dictionary mainly using a, a pencil and, and paper, mm -hmm. right? And and that also works. Um, so just remember that everything that we're talking about here today are options. Um, you, you need to d do what's best for your language and you need to use the tools that are best for you and best for your community. Um, do we have more to discuss on, on in terms of like building vocabulary or should we move on to how do we feel right now guys? I think we're good. I think if we move to the to the immersion techniques, because you were kind of starting to move into that just now anyways, if we glance okay. over those, I can throw those on the screen and we can talk about a few of them and see if there's any final questions. Cool. Um, so this is kind of fun. Uh, promoting your language is uh, the most open-ended part of language revitalization and probably the least discussed so i'm very excited that we have this in our toolkit because promoting your language is essentially about overcoming reluctance to speak it it's about getting your community excited again so that people start speaking the language again and that can take tons of different forms right it can mean starting a youtube channel it can mean starting a radio program uh kristen and i and i, I think anna louise have uh, and jacob also know uh, a man from nepal who runs Indigenous Languages Radio, and not podcasts, but like old school radio, because in Nepal, mm -hmm. that's still really popular. Uh, and it's just radio programs in the Indigenous languages of Nepal. A lot of uh, minoritized language activists from Europe are on YouTube and Twitter, um, like the Jerry A as uh, Association, uh, which represents a, 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 the Jerry A language, which is spoken in the Channel Isles between Britain and France, uh, are super into creating memes. And that's like how they promote their language, right? And like, so all of these different strategies um, kind of start with whether you should be meeting in person to use the language or whether you should be creating media to, um, uh, you know, promote the language to people all over the world. And I would love to open this up to Anna and Kristen and Jacob and, and, and see what they think about all this stuff. Yeah, the, the artists um, in this field, I think, are some of the most um, an important part of this discussion for promotion is to see um, artists using their language um, in music um, and other and other um, forms of art too, uh, poetry, um, street signs, murals, um, 
seeing your your language use in, in art is a really important part of it. Absolutely. Um, there's actually a really interesting case study, um, you know, in, in, in Spain and in France, more in, on the Spanish side, but the Catalan language has been very successfully revitalized um, since mm -hmm. the 1980s. And uh, after Spain became a democracy, um, it was now all of a sudden legal to speak the Catalan language again. And one thing that the local government did was subsidize the creation of media. And so if you wanted to start like a newspaper or publish books or TV shows or things like that, they would actually help pay for it. Because in those early mm -hmm. days, uh, there still wasn't enough demand to really do that on your own. These days, there's plenty of demand. Um, you know, newspapers in Catalan are profitable. They have a, a really big publishing industry. Um, they were actually one of the first non-English editions of Wikipedia. Um, but part of that started with creating all this media so that when kids learned their language in school, they felt like it was still a language um, to be used and interacted with. And so, um, you know, that doesn't need to be a government effort. Anyone can get started promoting their language online or in music or anywhere. Yeah, some of the best examples that we've put in the toolkit um, can really get, um, see the, like the vast array of possibilities. Um, there's a lot of people in Canada that I've heard of um, who are working on video games in different First Nations languages. And they feel that um, making video games is one of the best ways to see um, the culture represented in these inter interconnected, unique um, ways. So we, we've put some, um, some links to uh, Mushroom 11, which allows people to play in Algonquin and in Nuktitut and uh, Anishinaabe Moin. Um, there's, there's like so much cool stuff happening like that. Um, and uh, people also uh, publishing articles and translating articles on Wikipedia. There's huge community doing that. Many of you tuning in might already be involved with that. Um, and uh, people doing poetry festivals or language camps for kids and teens and other stuff. So all of this, all of these ideas kind of bring back to our initial part of the conversation, which was how do you create a team to revitalize your language? When you see all the different possibilities um, that you could do, it, that's a lot of different skill sets, right? So that's why you need a few core members um, to, to push these different um, aspects of the language into the into the public sphere. Exactly. Um, and sometimes promoting your language just in the spirit of, 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 you know, reminding ourselves that it's not all about the internet. Sometimes it just means like meeting up in person. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the Cornish language in the United Kingdom was you know, initially revitalized um, in the early, mid 1900s, but the movement really picked up momentum uh, in like the mid 2000s because people created Facebook groups, but used those Facebook groups to go meet up in person. And so they basically had these weekly or monthly bar meets where you'd go in a bar, drink some beer um, and talk in Cornish. Right. And that did a lot to raise the visibility of the language. And so maybe for your community, um, you know, just weekly meetups are all you really need. Yeah, 100 percent. So we have a question. Um, Azira from India asked, should we encourage the people speaking indigenous languages to write books in their language? This will promote and help the beginners to learn the language. Yes, we uh, we encur we encourage that um, for sure. As one, uh, we have at Living Tongues a documentation project going on um, to um, document the Birhor language, which is one of the Munda tribal languages. And as part of that project, we're producing the first ever children's books in Birhor. So that's uh, to do that. Um, we are trying to convey. Um, the, the look and feel and also the spirit of um, the local the local community's knowledge by using a, a local artist to do all the drawings in the book um, and also um, really trying to center that kids book around a lot of the local daily things that you see already so that the the kids are seeing their language represented in a children's book that's that's suitable for the environment 
so we definitely we definitely encourage that. We're not specialized in in children's book literature, but there's an, another amazing organization called NABU um, that is that we work with. Uh, <laughs> NABU is awesome. We love NABU, and they're out there producing. Um, kids books in um in haiti and rwanda and some other places too um so uh we might partner with them in the future to to create more more children's books it's actually really essential uh children's books in particular because for a lot of under documented languages the only book that's available is some like super academic dictionary or something that is really like that that doesn't help children right and they're the ones who more than anything need exposure to their language um and so children's books are just super important if the language is written if it's not then that's a whole other conversation but Yes, and we encourage also on the topic of kids, <clears throat> we we encourage um, language nests, um, which are <clears throat> excuse me places where um, toddlers can learn the language, um, and the people who are organizing and teaching those language nests don't necessarily have to be fluent speakers themselves, but just have enough knowledge of the language to teach to teach, to, to expose the young kids to the language too. So that can be done with no books at all, but just, you know, play time and games and, and, and songs and activities. So there's a lot of things you can do um, to, to create um, immersive experiences and environments, even if you have no books yet. <laughs> well, it's noon, what should we do, Kristen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm reading through some of the comments. We're talking about comic books and media and different uh, forms of sharing your language. Azira said that they will try that after you discuss that in children's books and publishing. Um, and we're discussing now comic books from Nigeria and Nigerian Pigeon. Um, cool. Yeah, some fun, some some fun conversations. Um, there was someone who spoke earlier uh, um, about how they feel like they're the only person in their area that cares about their language and cares about these oh. things. Um, so hopefully we can speak more about how to address that and get people excited um, to speak their language. So yeah, I think we can wrap up now. Um, if anyone has any questions in these final few minutes, please send them in. Um, I sent you all links at the beginning of where you can find the toolkit, but I will throw that on the screen right now. Hold on um, just a second. I would love to add to the person who feels that you're the only person that cares about your language, just get started. Um, you know, I know in the beginning we said find other people who are excited, but if you really feel like you're the only one, get started, make tweet, make the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. do whatever will promote the language in your community. Um, mm -hmm. We work with this one um, activist from Scotland who's one of the last speakers of his variety of Scottish Gaelic. And, you know, he's been charging forward on his own and is for several years and is starting to pick up, get support, you know, from the community and, and you know, just be determined and, and patient and hopeful. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm typing out all of our email addresses right now so I can throw that up on the screen. Um, I've sent my email address a few times already in the chat. If we talked about translation, if anyone's interested in translating and I didn't get around to talking to you, please send me an email. My email's on the screen right now. It's kristen at wikitongues.org. We're going to have the um, easier to read version of the toolkit ready really soon. Uh, I'm not gonna give a specific date because I might go a day over and I don't want to hold ourselves uh, accountable to that, but it's gonna be really soon. And so if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you would, Oh, that sounds like Braveheart. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so if you would like to help us translate it into other languages, um, we would we would love to have you join us for that. Thank you all for joining this. Um, I'll add Anna Luisa's email up here in case you want to message her about joining in on Talking Dictionaries. We'd love to have you on that. If you have any other questions, you can send us a message. And thank you for your patience while I was trying to navigate this software. I know at times I had our faces on someone who wasn't actually speaking. So next time it will be smoother, I promise. So thank you for your patience in that. Fair said, this was so clear and informative. Thank you so much for organizing this. 
Thank you for joining. If if you're interested in using the toolkit, you can download it for free. We'd love to hear from you if you're using it um, and work with you to help provide information and hear your updates on what's going on. Yes, with the less complicated toolkit, it's coming, Azira. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. And if you have requests for our future live stream, let us know. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Yeah, talk soon. Good day. Bye. Bye. Oh, I have to press end, don't I? Sorry. Bye again. <laughs>